From KPRC Channel 2, this is Houston Newsmakers with Cambrell Marshall. Good morning and welcome to Republican Congressman Wesley Hunt, representing the newly created 38th Congressional District. Good to see you. Happy to be here. Thank you so much, as always, for having me on. How does it feel uh, representing a district that hasn't been in existence before? I know it's, it's, a, it's such an honor to be the first congressman in a district like this. And the best part about it is, is this is the district that I grew up in. So I grew up in the north side of the district, kind of Spring Klein area. Mm -hmm. And then I drove one hour one way south to attend St. John's, mm -hmm. which is the southern border of the district. And I drove that route from middle school and high school. And lo and behold, 20 years later, here we are representing a district where the northern border is mm -hmm. Tomball Spring and Cypress area. Mm -hmm. And the southern border is where I went to high school and middle school every single day. What a blessing. It is a blessing indeed. Now, now you, you've gone to this point. How do you get the understanding about what your constituents want and need? Obviously, you're from the area, but how do you balance what you think they need and what you think is best? Well, what's really awesome about growing up in an area like this is there's no thinking about what, what the people in this district want and need. I already know and we align directly. Our top issue in our district is energy and oil and gas. The entire energy corridor is now in my district and that dictates what my top priority is. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it goes to preserving our energy independence, making sure that we have jobs, and all 800,000 people that live in my district, in some way, mm -hmm. they are tangentially related to and touched by the oil and gas in the energy sector. It's up to me to represent that and preserve it. All right, let's talk about the 118th yeah. Congress, which is where you are. Uh, it was not uh, without a bit of drama <laughs> to begin with. What a week. I know, I know. This is after Republicans, yeah. they have the uh, advantage in the majority, were not able to elect the House Speaker until after the longest uh, contest for Speaker in 146 years. Yeah. Now, here's the deal. After five days, 15th ballot, I'm guessing that um, this isn't the way you really envision your tenure no. as starting. And what do you think that that says? Does it say anything about uh, the millions of Americans watching? Does it say anything about the way that Republicans will govern? Yeah, I think it was actually fantastic the way that went down. And I know it seemed to be chaotic if you're on the outside right. looking in, but actually being down there on the House floor and listening and being a part of the negotiation process, we realized that we were working together to get the rules set up so that we can hit the ground running once we actually had a speaker. And that's how democracy works. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's messy. It doesn't always go as planned. But we aren't run by kings and by monarchs. We are run by we the people. Mm -hmm. So what we witnessed was a negotiation prog process for that first week that actually made it a very smooth process for the next six weeks while we convened Congress shortly after that. And so part of that negotiation was with members of your party who are considered far to the right in terms of yeah. their uh, philosophy. Yeah. Uh, and there's a, there's a, a general sense that Perhaps some of the negotiations ended up pushing the party a little bit more to the right while the bulk of Americans aren't far right. They're more in the middle. Is that, is that not accurate? Uh, or accurate? Not, not necessarily. Um, well, a lot of things that were discussed was what, what things were we going to vote on and in what order? Mm -hmm. So the first vote that I took as a congressman was to repeal 87,000 IRS agents. That was actually a part of the negotiation progress, mm -hmm. a, a process. And, and the progress from that was, you know what? Let's focus on spending and cutting spending because we don't have a tax revenue issue. We don't need more IRS agents going after the taxpayer. What we need is to figure out how to get spending under control. That was actually a part of the negotiation process. Well, and couldn't that be a little bit of both? Because if you don't, part of the process was to have those people out there. The perception is that the IRS agents that were going to be there were going to be collecting taxes from those who were in the upper levels who are getting away with not paying a whole lot of taxes. Well, that's a perception. I don't know. I, I hear that. I hear that. And, and what happens is this. When you hire 87, that, that's a lot of people, by the way, 87,000 IRS agents, you're not just going after the upper crust or the upper echelon or, or, or the upper 1%. What you're really kind of going after is everybody at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. When you have that many people combing through, IR, comb, combing through tax records, it's going to be an arduous process and you're going to end up hurting people that 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 results in unintended consequences mm -hmm. 
there's a fundamental difference in the way I think we view the world sometimes and than my colleagues on the left. And that is, I don't believe we have a tax revenue problem. Mm -hmm. In 2020, we had the highest tax revenue in the history of this country, and we still added $1.5 trillion to our debt. Mm -hmm. We have a spending problem, and I want to be a part of tackling that issue, and we're going to in the next few months when we have this debt ceiling conversation. Well, you know, as I noticed that over the last several years, I mean, administrations come and administrations go. Yes. The deficit continues to go up, up, up. That's and everybody's included. fault. Uh, oh, absolutely. So yeah. how do you go ahead and, and make everybody come to their senses about this? Because during, yeah. during the previous administration, the, it was going up, 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 and nobody was doing anything. Same well, problem. I shouldn't say nobody was doing anything about yes. it. But, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, and again, you know, I'm, I'm unapologetic. You know, I'm a Republican, and, and I supported President Trump, and he supported me in the last election and in this election. And I can say the one thing that I did not like was how, 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 how we spent as a country. And it's been that way since 2000. Mm. So now we're getting to a breaking point to where at some point we have to raise our hands and stop this because... I got three little kids at home. Mm -hmm. We are $31 trillion in debt, and the only thing that we're going to do is pass that on to your grandkids and to your daughters and to my, and to my children, and we are at the point, as a millennial, that we have to raise our hands and say, enough is enough. Mm -hmm. And the good thing is, just in the greater Houston area, there's, there's, there's me, there's, there's Congressman Morgan Luttrell, there's Dan Crenshaw, there's Troy Nels, and the best thing about that is that we're all under the age of 55 years old, mm -hmm. and I think it's time for us to have tough conversations to preserve our economic prosperity for the future, and it starts with getting spending under, under control. Fair enough. Um, one of the committees you're on, I understand, is judiciary. Yes. And so right off the bat, uh, um, the chair, uh, Jordan, subpoenas for big tech and secretary of education. Talk about that as a priority. Yeah. Um, well, well, the first hearing that we had actually a few weeks ago, the one that I participated in, was on the border. And what's happening at the border, this is this is not a partisan issue. Mm -hmm. We've had five million people enter our country illegally. We've had enough fentanyl to pour into our country to kill every single American five times. That was the first thing that we talked about. Moving forward for, for, for the big tech issue, the only thing we want to see is parity across the board. Mm -hmm. We want to protect people's First Amendment rights. And quite frankly, I don't care if you're a liberal, I don't care if you're a Democrat, you get to have the same voice as everybody else. Mm -hmm. I don't want to quell anybody's voice on the other side, just like I don't want the other side to quell our voices. And I think over the course of the past few years, that's been happening. Let's talk about something else that a lot of people are in agreement on, and that is there's too much gun violence in this country. Yeah. And over the last uh, week or so, we saw more young lives taken at, Mis at, uh, at uh, Michigan State University. Yeah. Saw that. Students killed, initial shooting, uh, three killed. It's a reminder that this country, we are unique in the shootings that kill people uh, in a lot of ways that shouldn't happen. Yeah. What do you suggest as a solution to that, or is there anything that can be done? It's, I would imagine, I don't know what to imagine. So yeah. you tell me what you think about that. Prosecutors have to prosecute, and we have to put violent criminals behind bars and keep them there. If you're looking at the rap sheet of the people that are committing these, these horrible, heinous crimes, this ain't their first rodeo. Literally, it's over 90% of these people have a record, and they actually should already be in prison. We also need to implement the laws that we already have on the books, or else making more laws is just going to give a criminal the opportunity to break that next law. Mm -hmm. And so there's a combination of trying to figure out how do we stop bad people from getting guns in their hands, but to do it in a way that we don't trample somebody's right to bear arms, but also do it in a way that we keep bad guys out of our population. How do we do that? And I think that's the conversation that needs to be had while I'm on judiciary. Okay. Well, we'll talk more about that as well. We've got more with Congressman Hunt after the break here. We'll talk about that. And we'll talk about who you're looking at as a mentor while you're in Congress. Oh, it's always yeah. important to be able to do that. Good question.